This is Codename Vermilion reporting in from the Missileless Industry Head Office in the Ark. My weapon is armed, and I'm about to make the events of Cyberpunk 2077 look like a temper tantrum. Nikkei, Goddess of Victory, is a game where the apocalypse is here, and it looks an awful lot like Horizon Zero Dawn. Humanity has been forced underground, and the last surviving bastion of humanity, the Ark, is only able to exist thanks to tactical combat harlots. They are the Nikkeis, cyborgs made with only one purpose, dying on the battlefield so humans don't have to. Why are we still here? Just to suffer. This game is what happens when you copy the homework of Girls Frontline, and then somehow make it hornier. Yes, Commander, I assure you, giving our combat droids the physique of supermodels is essential to their capabilities in a firefight. I'm gonna be real with you. This video only exists because Curiosity killed the cat. It's me. I'm the cat. Every time I saw ads for this game, I would roll my eyes because it's such obvious bait. And yet that tiny intrusive thought in the back of my mind would nag at me. What if it was more than just an elaborate excuse for blatant fan service for horny weebs who are into butts? Then I saw it was having a collab with Nier Automata. And I, uh... I can explain. Just having a near collab doesn't exactly make it special, but it was enough for me to give in to my curiosity and open Pandora's box. And while I wasn't surprised by much of what I saw, there certainly were things I wasn't expecting. Along our journey, we'll encounter such characters as an alcoholic, Tigbitty Goth GF, an asshole, and literally Hollow Life Hosho Marine. Wait a second, this isn't Azure Lane. So stay a while and listen as I tell you the tale of Nikkei and why it isn't what you think it is. It's time to stay there, to claim our names back. We will make it come back. Tell me what you want now. Yeah, remember stay there. My favorite part is when he said it's spoiling time and spoilered all over the video. The first thing that you see upon running this game is your Nikkei's... <clears throat> beautiful face. This is Marion, and after administering medical aid to the player character, she immediately enters combat. The air transport you were on crashed and there's already monsters closing in for the kill. The Raptures, as they are called, are the game's equivalent of those moving wood cutouts in a shooting gallery at a carnival. While I do like their designs, at the end of the day they are just mindless drones whose sole purpose is to kill or be killed. The starting tutorial sequence has you link up with Rappi and... <laughs> Anus. Two other Nikkeis whose commander died in battle. You continue to rescue other nearby Nikkeis who have been scattered as a result of their squads being partially destroyed by rapture attacks as the game continues to introduce its basic mechanics. What the heck kind of grenade launcher needs to charge up to fire? Throughout this, Marion sustains damage that would normally incapacitate a human, and this introduces the first difference between a Nike and a human. Despite looking like one, Nikkeis are largely mechanical. It was painfully obvious to me this early on that Nikkei, unlike the Hoyoverse games I've become accustomed to, is very much a mobile game with a PC port, rather than a game that can be played on mobile if you catch my drift. It also didn't help that the game didn't let me full screen until after the first chapter of gameplay, so the entire tutorial sequence actually looked like this. Approaching the largest signature of lost Nikkeis, something isn't right. It was a trap. The Raptures had corrupted Marion's mind, with the intention of luring you and all the Nikkeis you saved into an ambush. Fortunately for you, victory comes easy, but at a price. Marion is still alive, but she's too far gone. If a Nikkei is found to be corrupted, their commander must terminate them before they become a threat. Marion endangered you, yet she also saved your life. It's no wonder there's a moment of hesitation. Shikika. Okay. 
しかった。I'm not gonna lie, this completely caught me off guard. For a game that leans this hard into being a vehicle for fan service, this was surprisingly heavy. My curiosity was officially piqued. And now I was determined to find out if I had judged a book by its cover. The next segment of the game is an extended tutorial, which of course includes the obligatory first roll on your account. One thing that I find interesting is that your first mandatory pulls in Nikkei always include an SSR, which as far as I know deviates from the norm. Typically your first pull on an account is always a predetermined character, and as a result that character is considered a part of the starter pool since they're given to you as a part of the tutorial. However, in Nikkei, you can get any standard SSR in your starter rolls. So of course, it checks out that I pulled one of the lowest rated characters in the game. This is where I'd like to touch on something that I haven't discussed on this channel up until this point. Account rerolling. In gacha games, it's a common practice for players to play through the first part of a game. Then if they don't roll the characters they want with the resources given to new players, they make a new account and start again. This is something that I haven't brought up until now, because for me at least, pretty much all of the games I've covered take too long to reroll to be worth doing. However, getting to this starting 10 pull in Nikkei can be done relatively quickly, especially since you can skip cutscenes. So I made a new account with one of my other email addresses and rerolled, and I got the highest rated character in the game. <laughs> yeah, boy. The next chapter of the story, unfortunately, is a step down from the first. To replace Marion, you're assigned Neon who <sighs> is one of my least favorite characters in the game. She is the definition of the term battle bimbo. There's so much air in her head that it could serve as a three hour oxygen supply were you to ever go scuba diving. Your squad is sent out on a suicide mission to collect some supplies and surprise, it goes poorly. As punishment for failing the mission, you and your squad are banished to the outpost a run-down crap hole that is under constant siege by raptures. Now this is mainly a narrative device to introduce you to the game's farmville looking dingus of a system. In my opinion, it does hold water because they reveal that you were set up to fail on purpose. Your commanding officer, Anderson, wants you away from the prying eyes of the central government, as does the Elysian CEO, Ingrid. Speaking of CEOs, let me back up a second to give some background info. There are essentially four main political powerhouses in the Ark. The central government, and the three Nikkei manufacturing companies. In typical cyberpunk dystopian fashion, these CEOs are essentially royalty and untouchable. So there's really nothing you or your squad can do when the missileless CEO, Suyen, busts down your door and demands that you run a mission for her. She does send two of her own Nikkeis to support you, but holy crap is this trio one of my most hated in the entire game. Suyin is insufferable. As for Mihara and Yuni, I'm gonna let y'all take a wild guess as to who those two were designed to appeal to. Mihara, <laughs> Don't let your kids watch it! My eyes were about ready to roll out of my skull at this point. You're tasked with finding a special rapture codenamed Chatterbox, who reportedly has been heard mimicking human speech. Yeah, about that. As it turns out, he can speak fluently, and is also jacked. He's got crazy regenerative powers, and his boss theme is basically store brand doom music. Things probably would have ended there if it weren't for the arrival of one of the coolest characters in the game, Snow White my beloved. She doesn't waste time with those pea shooters your squad call guns. She straight up open carries a howitzer. Bitches love cannons! Oh, that's an anti-tank rifle. Oh, that's an anti-tank rifle! Girl with comically oversized weapon is peak fiction and I will die before I ever stop thinking it's awesome. Thankfully, Chatterbox runs off and your squad manages to limp home. Of course, no good deed goes unpunished. For breaking the chain of command and conducting an unsanctioned mission, Rappi and Mihara are sentenced to having their memories erased. While unfair, it could have been a lot worse, I guess. 
Especially considering that for whatever reason, the mind wipe didn't work on Rappi. Anyhow, what happens next is one of the most glorious moments in the entire game. Suyin randomly shows up again and starts demanding that you run another mission for her. Rappi pretends to not recognize her after the mind wipe, and then identifies her as an intruder and breaks her ribs. That's what you freaking get, Corpo scum! The next story arc is where I really started to feel the developer starting to pad for time. It spans three chapters, but if I'm going to be honest with you, it should have been just compressed into one. It doesn't help that this is the part of the game where progression begins to slow down. For context, the first four chapters of the game can be completed within the first day of gameplay. The next three, however, took about four days worth of in-game resources. This is in part due to the unique approach Nikkei takes to time-gating its content. Typically in mobile games, there are some sort of stamina points or other limited resource that bottlenecks your ability to progress through the game. You either spend stamina to get resources needed to upgrade your characters, or spend it to play the next portion of the game's story, or both. Nikkei streamlines this by just having resources needed to upgrade characters passively accumulate over time. Then they make each level in the story require progressively stronger characters to clear, and in turn, the more stages you clear, the more resources passively generate for you to continue upgrading your characters. While it is elegant in its simplicity, this does begin to massively slow down your ability to consume the story over time. You can go from completing multiple chapters a day, to around a chapter a day, to being lucky if you can progress to the next story cutscene. I've gotta say, I'm not a fan of this system. It makes it really hard to remain invested in the world and characters, many of whom still haven't shown up in the main campaign for me yet. I was originally going to make this video once I had completed all of the available story chapters, naively thinking that it would be similar to other games where you can play through the main campaign and then move on to evergreen content from there. I've been playing the game for over a month now, and as I'm writing this, I've only cleared chapter 14 of 24. For the most part, you can tell the game was primarily made for you to set it to auto battle and then ogle your squad of waifus as they burn through more lead than an 1800s paint factory. Are your numbers big enough? You're clear to go, are they not? Well, maybe you could go in manually and clear it, but usually it's not worth bothering at all. Most of the time when playing Nikkei, I either set it to auto and then swap to my second monitor to watch YouTube or something while it goes through the motions, or it's a complete exercise in futility because it's mathematically impossible to do enough damage to clear the level. Every now and again there's a fight where you'll be able to clear it if you control your squad manually instead of on auto. And to Nikkei's credit, that sweet spot can be pretty fun at times. It's just a shame that those moments are pretty sparse. Returning to the story, this time we are dispatched to find out more about Snow White and the mysterious group of Nikkei she's a part of, only known as the Pilgrims. They live exclusively on the surface, don't answer to any humans, and are elite fighters in a league of their own. Supposedly there's more information about them at a research base in the north. Oh hey, it's Alice! I was wondering what her deal was ever since I first pulled her. At first, I thought she fell under the Alice in Wonderland but she's clinically insane trope, but on further investigation, it heavily implies that she just has the mind of a young girl? That, uh, makes her design problematic, to say the least. If her outfit looks like it would be really cold, that's because it is. The Ice Queen and Alice decide to join you in clearing out the raptures that currently occupy the research base and the fight that follows is legitimately one of the coolest moments in the entire game. You see, the base is the boss. The fortifications turning out to be the shell of a colossal rapture was pretty freaking awesome. And the fight itself managed to hit that sweet spot I mentioned earlier where it actually requires manual control and some level of engagement to complete. I was once again caught off guard. What do you mean this game is actually fun sometimes? The research base gets you the data you need, the Ice Queen and Alice head back to their home base, and then your squad heads out for where the pilgrims are expected to be next. Surprise! You get ganked by Chatterbox instead. After a brief torture session in which he breaks multiple of your fingers, all while your leg is still broken from the last time you met him, by the way. Snow White shows up and they fight, Chatterbox runs off, and then basically the entire next chapter is just the commander limping behind Snow White while heavily wounded as she tracks down your squad. 
the number of stages you have to slog through is greatly increased compared to previous chapters, too. Do you see why I said it feels like the devs were padding for time? While calling for help, something interesting finally happens. An encounter with a heretic. If pilgrims are vigilante Mikes that live on the surface, it doesn't take much to guess what a heretic is. This one is named Modernia, and don't let her appearance fool you. She's far more powerful than she lets on. Part of this is because she pilots a sick flying exosuit that's armed to the teeth. Fortunately, we know its weakness. A metric butt-ton of bullets. In the fight, her mask shatters, revealing a familiar face. Well, that's what the game tells us, anyhow. I gotta be real with you, if it weren't for the story outright saying that she's actually Marion, I wouldn't have connected those dots. Just as she starts remembering that she's Marion, she explodes in a giant black energy blast and then disappears. Finally, the story got interesting again. You get rescued, and then back home you and your squad are designated as a special commando unit. Huzzah! While resting, Snow White randomly breaks into your house to thank you for assisting her in fighting Chatterbox, and hands you a bullet covered in a strange substance. Get us? Jeez, she could have at least knocked. She advises you get it scanned, as it'll provide some of the answers to the questions raised by the encounter with Modernia. What a great setup! I'm sure that the plot will go back to having good pacing from here on out. It's filler time! While the next chapter of the game does have plot relevance, a grand total of three important things happen. You go to the central government's data center to try and find out more details on the weird bullet Snow White gave you. The hacker gamer girl Nikkei Exia tells you that the only equipment capable of getting the scan you need is a pre-rapture era facility on the surface. So you go to the facility, scan it, and surprise! There's no data on the substance. The only thing you learn is that it's called Vupus. <coughs> Vapus. <coughs> Va... Unchained. Then on the way home, Exia gets freaking swatted because she hacked into the central government's main database and hit Control F on the word Unchained. Exia begins incinerating her brain to prevent the central government from finding out what you were investigating, only for said brains to get splattered all over the wall. Honestly, the events of the chapter itself isn't what's bad here. It's the fact that, for me, it was spread out over the course of three real-time days. Unlike other games where I can just sit down and play a segment of the story from start to finish at my own pace, in Mike I have to play the story as soon as my squad is able to clear it, otherwise it'll take even longer to progress through the game overall. Oh, by the way, Exia is fine. Even though her Grey Matter experienced rapid, unscheduled disassembly, she's back at the data center as if nothing happened. How is this possible? Nanomachine, son! Sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Fortunately for us, she texted Hololive Amelia Watson, I mean Novel, a message in code that informs us that Unchained is a substance that disrupts the nanomachines in Anike's brain and ends their immortality. So up until this point, we've been told that Nikes are irreversibly destroyed should their brain be damaged, but apparently even that's not enough. Full incineration or Unchained seem to be the only true way a Nike can die. Otherwise, the nanomachines can just rebuild a Nike from backup. This system is called the Neuroimplanted Machine for Protecting Humans, or NIMF, because of course it's called that. You'd think that learning this would cause some sort of existential dread in the characters who learn about it, but don't worry about it. They certainly don't. So, after that lore bomb, your squad is next tasked with a joint operation. Apparently, the Elysian CEO Ingrid has gotten word that a battle between the heretics and the pilgrims happened on the surface, and your task is to go scavenge the site for research materials. Heretics and pilgrims are quite literally built different, so any wreckage from the battle might have more answers. Ingrid sends the elite squad that saved you way back when to assist. If their uniform looks similar to Rappi's, that's because they are. Rappi used to be a part of that squad, but left some time ago and it left some bad blood between her and the squad leader, who, by the way, is a total prick. Halfway there, we discovered that we're being tailed by Missilis' top squad, Mattis. It's comprised of two cringe lords and Maxwell, the best girl. I'll talk more about why she's one of the best characters in the game later. For now, let's just leave it at she's the only normal one on her squad. Yada yada yada, shenanigans happen. Okay, here we go. The site of the heretic pilgrim battle. Everybody gangsta till the ground starts sprouting tentacles. After you send that abomination back to where it belongs, the ground gives out, and you're now stranded in a giant underground facility. It's filled with jamming devices, and almost seems to twist and turn around you. In spite of this, Mattis presses forward, 
using their special abilities to navigate this labyrinth of a building towards readings of the materials you're hoping to recover. And soon enough, you're in a room with the thing you were all searching for, a fragment of a heretic. Oddly enough, there are no nearby raptures. Before you have a chance to retrieve it, everyone opens fire on Mattis. Why would they do this? Well, as it turns out, there's an easy explanation for why Mattis was able to effortlessly navigate the facility. They're corrupted, just like Marion was. You hardly have any time to react before the building roars to life. There were no nearby raptures, because you're already inside of one. Fortunately, that's nothing excessive gunfire can't fix. Say, there are an awful lot of boxes laying around. I wonder what's inside the- Oh. Welcome back. Things aren't going so hot. Mattis has been put into cryosleep. Suyin has been unable to reverse the effects of the corruption, but at least freezing them prevents them from getting any worse. Meanwhile, the government has been doing strange experiments with the heretic fragment. As it turns out, if a Nikkei part touches it, the fragment eats it. So basically, that facility we were just at was one giant rapture that eats Nikkeis and turns them into heretics. Thus, it's paramount that the facility is destroyed. This is probably one of the best chapters in the game. It's all-out war, and the central government and the three CEOs have all banded together to send their best Nikkei squads to take down the facility. My wild guns! This time, Modernia is in the area, and a harebrained scheme is hatched. Using the Unchained Bullet, the commander will try to break Modernia from the influence of the Raptors and bring back Marion. What follows is a super hype team-up sequence where everyone bands together to support your squad in getting to Modernia and taking her down. The other Nikkeis are tasked with keeping Modernia occupied for as long as they can while you rush to their location. It's still a great distance away, however, and the odds aren't looking great. There's... Okay, ramming through enemy lines with an armored hover train is pretty awesome. What's even crazier is that you're not the only game in town. There's a Rapture Train, too. Just like the Land Eater Fortress, this would have been one of the coolest surprises in the game if it weren't for the fact that I already fought this boss daily for multiple weeks before I got to this point in the story. What's that? You wanted upgraded gear for your Nikkeis? Get spoiled, idiot. It's still pretty cool, but definitely would have been a lot cooler had I not played this fight to death already. In general, despite the near overwhelming influx of new characters that appear out of nowhere and disappear just as quickly, it really does a lot to give a sense of scale to the battle. Even Snow White shows up when Chatterbox gets in your way. And more than that, this fight has a special meaning for all Nikkeis involved. This is one of the first times the military has seriously made a rescue effort for any Nikkei, rather than just treating them as expendable equipment. You arrive just in time to take down Modernia. Readying your gun, you prepare that special bullet. You don't have what it takes to kill me. <laughs> As you start bleeding out, Rappi activates a hidden power-up and performs percussive maintenance on Marion. Oh hey, she's back now! Stabilizing the commander, the day is finally won. And then the monkey's paw curls a finger. Hurtling from the sky, Chatterbox manages to bite Marion before rolling on the ground as a decapitated head. In spite of your squad's efforts to shoot him down, it's too late. Marion's corruption has begun again. It's moments like these where you can really hear the emotion in the voice acting for this game. At this point, I should have expected an emotional gut punch, but like every time before, I wasn't prepared. The corruption is too far gone. The only shot Marion has at recovering is a complete neural wipe. She'll have to relearn to speak or even walk. The order is signed, and the wipe is done. Oddly enough, once she's returned to the outpost, she still remembers her name and the word commander. Maybe you are special after all. It's in your blood. No, quite literally, it's in your blood. Apparently your blood type is hyper rare and valuable to the point where it's purposefully left off of any medical records for your safety. For the time being, at least, Marion is finally home. Even though Marion has quickly relearned how to speak and other basic things, 
that doesn't make dealing with her easy. Her erratic behavior is not unlike that of a child. Marion questions why we're fighting the Raptors at all. A question that, while innocent, would kick off quite the ordeal. Under the pretense that Marion is sympathizing with Raptures, central government troops start assaulting the outpost and you have no choice but to flee to the surface to ditch them. Between the Raptures on one hand and the government hit squads on the other, it's not long before you're surrounded by waves of mass-produced Nikes. However, handing over Marion isn't an option. Because if you did, she would be vivisected piece by piece until there's nothing left to study. Just as you're about to make your last stand, Anderson calls everyone to stand down. Anderson may have gotten them to back off for now, but for as long as Marion remains at the outposts, they're sure to be back. There's only one way to solve the situation, and for that, you call on the help of an old friend. When Marion saw Snow White and the other pilgrims, she finally understood why she was brought all the way here to the surface, and you bid her a heart-wrenching farewell. Which, while very sad, probably would have hit a lot harder had they toned down the fan service. At this point, the devs are doing a lot better with the story's pacing, it's just that the time between segments of the story is starting to get unbearably long. I'm going to be completely honest with you, it was at this point that I had decided to start producing this video so I could drop the game for good. As for why, it's simply because... Let me run down a typical day in the life of a Nikkei player, and hopefully that explains why just over a month, I felt the grind was starting to get to me. Log in, claim outpost materials and wipe out, send social points, claim daily crystals from the cash shop, claim free items from the common shop two times, buy out skill upgrade materials from the PvP shop, go into unskippable dialogue with up to eight Nikkeis, upgrade your primary Nikkeis, do the interception daily boss, spend the next two or three minutes giving hand-me-downs to all of your other Nikkeis, do the simulation room daily run, do the daily three levels of tribe tower, do six battles in the rookie PvP mode, and then two battles of the special arena PvP mode. Go to the outpost and claim all dispatches and resend them. Claim daily tasks, claim liberation points, claim battle pass points. Oh, and if there's an event going on, which there usually always is, you gotta run daily event missions, event challenge mode, redeem event dailies, and buy stuff from the event shop. On top of this, sometimes you gotta run co-op or solo raid if those are active. While I don't necessarily mind running all of these activities, what I do mind is how much time it takes for how little progress it gives. After a month, I was really starting to feel the diminishing returns, and the story really started to feel like it was getting stretched thinner than ever. I was ready to throw in the towel, but then I was blindsided by the- I was not expecting just how hard they would go for this game's first anniversary. Coming from the sad breadcrumbs Genshin gives out for its anniversaries, Nikkei basically flooded me with tons of easy dopamine. We got a stupid amount of free event pulls, one free event pull per day, a free SSR with guaranteed upgrades, a story event with writing that went hard and expanded on the events of the Rapture Invasion, and even a fully fleshed out Vampire Survivors clone. It also helps that I got insanely lucky and got a bunch of the rarest SSRs in the game back to back. It's her! The Goddess of Victory! And even got the featured SSR from one of the free daily pulls. I went from struggling in the Pilgrim Tower with just two units, to BTFOing everything in the game with a fully stacked team. My main team now punches well above its weight, all because of these insane pulls. One thing that does help is they also significantly nerfed the story's difficulty. While I still think they should have nerfed it further, I did get basically an entire extra chapter with my existing team before I pulled all of the busted pilgrims. As it stands though, I'm not exactly impressed with the story I've seen beyond the part where you drop Marion off at Pilgrim Daycare. I guess they wanted to ease off the heavy emotions for a bit. However, once again I'm running into the problem of the entire game hanging on what little story progress I can make daily, and what I'm seeing is just not worth the time I have to wait to actually experience it. I don't mind the story having a little time gating, but a player should always be able to play through an entire story arc uninterrupted if you want them to remain invested. <laughs> One thing that I keep going back and forth on is whether this game is self-aware enough. On the one hand, it's clear that the marketing team knows their target audience, 
and the game is not beating the horny on main allegations. But then they'll toss in surprisingly good writing, such as exploration of how Nikkeis are discriminated against in the Ark society, or ponderings on what it means to be human. The Commander could have easily been just your average wish-fulfillment vehicle that is a loser degenerate, but the majority of character stories actually have romantic interest build-up due to the Commander being one of the first people ever to… actually treat them as human beings with genuine kindness? Some of the stories aren't even focused on romance at all. There are a number of them that are just the Commander helping that Nikkei get more friends or break out of their shell into a more happy situation. And then they'll turn around and run an event where the commander is a substitute teacher, and he's got two schoolgirls clamoring for his affection. Hey guys, two quick questions. Uh, number one, what the f*** am I looking at? Number two, can we not do this? For f*** I really wish that event had a I'm your teacher and it's inappropriate for me to date students option. In general, I really do think that if the game reigned in the horny even a little bit, the character designs would be noticeably better and, dare I say it, more attractive? Take Rappi for example. As the game's mascot character, I get that showing off her butt is how they market the game's fan service. but if she had even a mini skirt, her design would be so much better. Or how about Mika, aka the most lightly armed Ukrainian soldier? Her design is so close to being great, but come on! At least give the poor girl some booty shorts. In general, I personally find that the designs that are actually military-themed are way more appealing and interesting than the blatant waifu bait. Come on, let the girls wear some tactical gear, dang it! Some of these I can let slide because they're gangsters or secret agents or whatever, but some of these are just plain goofy. Why the heck is a shopping live streamer in the middle of a gunfight? She do be rocking that prestige 14 gold camo, though. Also, care to explain why children are being made into Nikkeis? Lore-wise, Nikkeis are supposedly carrying weapons that are too heavy or have too much recoil to be operated by normal humans. But man, it does not look like that most of the time. Rather than looking like normal assault rifles or carbines, they instead would be a lot more believable if they were chunky monsters like Warhammer 40k's bolt guns, or energy weapons that look like they need a small nuclear reactor to run. It's for these reasons why I unironically think that Product 12 has better design than a big chunk of the SSR Nikkeis. She's got cool futuristic looking armor, and her LMG actually looks like something heavy enough to only be carried by a cyborg. I especially love the detail that since she's carrying a giant ammo backpack, when she's reloading, she's actually swapping out the barrel of her gun rather than changing out the ammo belt. In a similar vein, this is why I said Maxwell is best girl. They incorporate her light cat girl motifs as a thing that actually makes her design more believable. Most notably, her tail is actually a power cord that feeds into her railgun, something that could reasonably need to be powered by an EK's core. In addition, her cybernetic legs look like something actually necessary to lug around her external battery packs. She's proof that the Nikkei devs can balance the waifu elements with logical explanations that allow for suspension of disbelief, they just choose not to. In contrast to Nikkei's waffling about the fanservice nature of their character designs, 2B from Nier Automata's design isn't pretending to be anything it isn't. Yoko Taro, the game's director, has gone on record saying that 2B is designed the way she is because he finds it hot. This honesty is, quite frankly, refreshing. So on that note, I have a confession. I haven't actually played Nier Automata. So why do I have these? For that, I'm going to thank the sponsor of this video, AnimeDakimakuraPillow.com. They sent me this 2B pillow cover, this figure of 2B, an acrylic lamp of Ganyu from Genshin Impact, as well as a keychain and samples of the various fabrics their Dakimakura pillow covers are made from for free. They have no creative control over this video, which means I get to say stuff like, Dakimakuras are cringe. Yes, I may be cringe for having one of these, but also, I'm a VTuber. Being cringe comes with the territory. I have to say, the print job on the cover is nice and crisp. The fabric is quite soft. This particular cover is the peach skin fabric, which is the entry level type. There's three other varieties, and I gotta say I was really impressed with the texture of the Japanese textile in two-way varieties. If I were to get another one of these covers, I'd definitely pick one of those fabrics. What really caught my interest, however, is how AnimeDakimakuraPillow.com carries more than just body pillows, which is why I nabbed the acrylic light and 2B figure. Did you know that Square Enix makes their own figures? Yeah, that Square Enix. Now, I already knew that Square Enix doesn't exactly have a great track record when it comes to making figures, 
Which is why I could never really justify buying this figure of 2B with my own money. And that's why I was really excited at the prospects of getting one on somebody else's dime. And yeah, I totally get why this particular one doesn't have a great reputation now. That having been said, this wasn't exactly unexpected. Square Enix is just not all that great at making figures in general. Even their flagship line, Play Arts Kai, is usually plagued with issues. Here's the 2B figure side by side next to the Play Arts Kai Sam Gideon from the game Vanquish, Figma Mona from Good Smile, and the Gundam Universe RX-78-2 from Bandai. I would have put the high-grade Jesta here because Jesta sweet, but I haven't had time to paint it yet. Since I got the 2B figure for free, I'm more than happy to add it to my collection. Thanks once again to AnimeDakimakuraPillow.com for that. They carry a number of other figures that are better than this one, as well as a range of other products. <laughs> p.com is my favorite place to get Fortnite and Fast and Furious merch. <laughs> Wait a second. Why are three of these silhouettes holding Kalashnikov rifles? While their offerings are a tad pricey compared to ordering from other online shops, they do provide really good quality control and relatively fast shipping. There's definitely a lot of utility to be had in the consistency and speed of ADP.com. Thanks once again, back to the video. While we're on the topic of Nier Automata, at the beginning of the video you may recall that I mentioned that their collab with Nikkei is what got me into this game in the first place. Let's talk about it. What I was surprised by is that not only was the Nier collab more than just a quick cash grab, but that it actually worked really well with the setting of Nikkei and Nier. I suppose it makes sense given that both are games where humanoid robotic beings are in a post-apocalyptic war and deal with themes of what it means to be human. I was surprised by the depth they managed to touch on in the event storyline with what little screen time they had to work with, even if it was a glorified isekai. They even went so far as to compose original music for the thing rather than just copying over Nier's soundtrack. They also made a actually fun hacking mini game that wasn't just a generic puzzle? What the heck? They really didn't have to go this hard for the crossover, but I really appreciate that they did. While I don't anticipate them doing a rerun of the Nier crossover, one thing I really like about the events in this game is that doing them gives you an item that lets you unlock a previous event storyline to be able to play through it at any time. While it kinda sucks that you don't get any rewards for playing through it like you would in Honkai Star Rail, keeping the storylines accessible within the game itself is a massive leg up from Genshin. Surprisingly, Nikkei has significantly better odds of pulling SSRs than pretty much any other gacha game. Rather than having a pity system that happens when you pull, however, it instead does the thing where every pull gives you a token, and 200 tokens let you buy any of the current event SSRs from the shop. So while you could wind up like this guy and pull 400 times and not get a single SSR and then want to commit high altitude sea mammal, Hello ground! Unlike Tower Fantasy, the event tokens carry over to future banners, and pretty much all event SSRs are immediately added to the standard banner afterwards. The standard banner even lets you pick which SSRs will drop. However, this is where the monkey's paw curls another finger. As if the issues with how the story is time-gated weren't enough, there is also a hard limiter on progression that gatekeeps pretty much all of the endgame. First, let me explain one of the best features of this game, the Synchro Device. This lets you choose characters that are then immediately boosted to the lowest of your top 5 highest level Nikkeis. This means that effectively, you only need to focus on leveling one squad, and all of your other ones will follow along with their progress. If it weren't for this feature, large parts of the game would be borderline unplayable, especially once it starts requiring multiple squads of Nikkeis to get things done. There is a catch though, the level cap. By default, the max level a Nikkei can reach on their own is level 160. However, if you get three additional copies of that character, 
their level cap increases to 200. This means that until you get a full squad of SSRs that all have their star rating maxed out, you're effectively locked out of progressing everyone past the level 160 barrier. This is the fine print that follows the giant asterisk tacked on to the end of the game's otherwise rather generous gacha rates. This means that if your luck is bad enough, you could be artificially held back from endgame content for months before you get that top squad assembled. Once I found out about this, I finally understood why I was so baffled by just how many SSRs I was getting as a free-to-play player. Generally, I've gotten a majority of the SSR roster, which is a huge contrast to games like Genshin, where I've only gotten as many limited units as I have through a rather frankly embarrassing amount of spending over the course of actual years. Generally, I don't feel any desire to wail on this game, and yet, Nikkei is one of the few gacha games in my recent memory where I'm actually excited to roll? Maybe it's because I've actually committed to being free to play, so there's actual risk of not getting the featured character. Maybe it's because I don't know the characters that well, that I have the surprise of getting something unexpected. I have no clue why I'm even bringing this up. If anything, this is me basically complaining that Nikkei isn't psychologically manipulating me enough. Maybe the gacha brain rot really is starting to get to me. The short answer is no, you shouldn't play Nikkei. Setting aside my stance that it is unethical to recommend any gacha game, Nikkei still has numerous issues. While the art design is quite good, the objectification of the characters is problematic, the gameplay is shallow, and the story, while surprisingly good for a game of this nature, is spread far too thin to carry the experience of grinding out upgrades for prolonged periods of time. If the game were more willing to let you use quick battle, maybe the tedium of doing dailies would be cut down enough to be tolerable. But in general, I really wish the game were more like the Lost Sector game mode where there's actual navigation puzzles, rather than just sitting through glorified gunfight cutscenes. One thing that is a huge recommend, though, is the soundtrack. They really did not have to go as hard as they did with the music for this game, but they did it anyway. As far as ways to waste your time on your phone goes, there are certainly worse ones, but I wouldn't consider Nikkei a good one either. While I did find occasional enjoyment in this game, it's time for me to move on. At the very least, however, I can say this, Nikkei isn't what I thought it was. Hunters, listen,